All right. Hello, Ron. How are you doing, man? Hey, Jody. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Everyone enjoyed our, uh, or your talk, rather. Uh, they really enjoyed hearing you and uh, all that you had to say last couple of nights. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. Yeah. And they all said they missed you. Everybody who's been to Israel, every one of them have said they sure miss you, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm missing also each one of you. That's cool. Well, we're going to start tonight and um, sharing tonight. You and I talked about this. We're going to start uh, tonight in, in our discussion about the blood and the blood of Jesus in regards to how it connects with Passover. And um, so, man, I'm just going to turn it over to you and let you get started, my man. Yeah. So, um, you know, when uh, I'm going back to the story we already read and revised about what happened in Egypt in the last night when the sons of Israel were spending there before the Exodus. And I'm reading again from, uh, from Exodus 12 that uh, the instructions that the Lord gave to Moses and he, he, told him, he told him, you should keep, you should keep it until the 14th day. Keep it, it means the, the lamb that they took four days in their homes. They keep it for 14 days of the same month, the first month of the sun. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. More, moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Now, when I tell this story and read this, if, you know, a person that is a very educated and uh, intellectual, and he doesn't necessarily really believe in God. And when he reads this, he says, what is this? What are they doing? I mean, this is, uh, this is archaic. It's obsolete. Nobody do such things these days. This is, this is, and people say, this is the, the reason why I don't like the Bible. It's, it's so horrible. Things people are doing, they killing lambs to, you know, many people today are vegans. They don't want to kill any animal and certainly don't want to deal with the blood and all this. And, you know, this is, it, you don't, we don't like this. I mean, when you don't like, we don't like our children to, to hear these stories. And this is the, the first um, expression that might come from people that read this the first time. But then, uh, you know, and then some, for example, we have now a big problem in the world. The whole world is under some kind of attack. The whole world. It's a virus. You know, we very educated people, we thought that viruses are already under our con complete control because we have vaccinations. And then suddenly we see that the whole world cannot, cannot deal with, with, with this plague. Yeah. And, uh, and then people start to be very afraid. And you know, you start to hear people are dying from this disease yeah. more, more and more, and it's becoming terrible. And what happened to people when they face death they start, you know, many of them go to witches, to mediums, to, well, some people go, people that are believers, they will go to God, or maybe people that grew up in a church, they will return and they will, and, and I think in this time, you, I hear that many people are approaching the churches again because people are afraid to die. And, and this is the thing, when you're afraid to die, your, your intellect, and your, uh, your mind, your, your wisdom go away, and then you, 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 you rely on God. That's what happens. And then you start to understand what is really there. What is all this story about? And you know, the blood 
is something that is very mysterious because uh, we, when we learn about this in biology, we know the blood is what brings uh, oxygen to all our cells. We also know that our immune system is in the blood and many things about the blood are known to today. But still every person when he sees, when you see your blood, you feel some kind of fear. You know, every child, the first time they see their blood, they start to cry. Something about the blood doesn't feel, we don't feel comfortable with our blood. Mm -hmm. And you know, and here is the question. You know that uh, if you ask people today, where is the soul? where the soul resides in, in us. Uh, many people today will say the soul is in the, or in, the, in the past they say it's in the heart or in the brain. Generally, those are the organs you think where the soul is. But this is not what God tells us. The, the question where is the soul is very interesting and it's very clear in the Bible, where is the soul? And I want to read now Leviticus 17. And the word, now I want to explain something. The word soul in Hebrew and the word life in Hebrew, in the biblical Hebrew, they're, they're the same word. The word is nefesh. Nefesh in Hebrew, in, in Hebrew either today. Today, when you say nefesh, you mean soul. Because today, uh, with psycho modern psychology, we separate between soul, spirit, and body. We look at them as three different entities. But in the Bible, also, if uh, people try to understand what really is the difference between the three of them, it's not very clear. And in the Bible, when you say soul or life, sometimes you use the word nefesh. So read now, let's read what Leviticus tells us about the life and the soul. And I'm reading, reading from Leviticus 17. 11, 12. For the life or soul of the flesh is in the blood. The life and the soul is in the blood, not in the brain, not in the heart, in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Therefore, I said to the son of Israel, no person among you may eat blood, nor may any alien who sojourns among you eat blood. I don't know how much you thought about this, but God tells us that the life and the soul is in the blood. And the, other, and the consequence is, or the meaning of that is, that you should not eat the blood, the blood of the animal should not be eaten. It's said here very clear. Now, if you, you think to yourself, okay, this is probably only something of the law of the Torah that the Jews had to follow, uh, I want to tell you that this is not the case. Because Noah, Noah who was in the ark, and this was before Israel, before Abraham, before the Hebrews, he had the covenant with God after the end of the flood and he saw the rainbow, God made a covenant with him. And then God told him in Genesis 9, starting from verse 3, God, you know, before Noah, before the flood, uh, in, in Genesis, in the, in, in the beginning, uh, Adam and Eve, they were told to eat the plants and the grass. They were not told to eat animals. But then after the flood, look what God tells them. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I give the green plant. And now, only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. And now this is the very known sentence. 
whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. What do you think about this, Jody, when you re read well, this? Uh, well, I was, I was thinking when you said it, I was thinking also about a scripture that is in Acts. I was flipping over to this, but Acts 15, you know, when Paul, all the discussion went back and forth between the Gentiles and, and the Jews. But one of the things that they laid upon the Gentiles, because they, they were so far behind in trying to keep up with the commandments, uh, even then in Acts 15, 19, uh, the, as they were talking to the Gentiles saying, yeah, you can come to Christ, you need to come to salvation. But listen, verse 19, they said, and so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. So even to the Gentiles, it was it was given the same instruction. That's new covenant. So right. that's what I thought of when you when you mentioned it. Right. And why not the strangled animal? Because why do people strangle animals so that the blood will not come out? So the, it's the same thing. Not in, eating the blood. You know how Jewish slaughter animals, either chicken or cows, whatever they cut their throat. Why? Because the moment that you cut the throat, the animal dies, but also bleeds to death. So, and Jews don't eat blood. Now, uh, this, is, this is a very interesting thing for Christians to think about, because many people that are Christians, they don't think about the fact that they were instructed not to eat blood, as, as you just read, and this was uh, Peter was saying that in Acts, and uh, or uh, sorry, Paul, and, um, and and yes, the reason is very clear because from all the laws in the in the law in the in the Torah, those are the only one that were said to the Gentiles to follow. Just as you read, um, abstain from things uh, contaminated by idols and by fornication, and from what is strangled, and from blood. Those are the things. Um, very interesting. Why? The, so you see that the blood is very, very important. And it comes from the law. I think about that when you uh, were saying that uh, my grandfather used to process. So here, I, I, I think you mentioned this in Israel, there are not uh, many deer, or maybe there are no deer left in Israel. I can't remember what you said before. It, is that right? Are there yes. no deer left? Yeah, so my grandfather, so here we have an abundance. We could, we could uh, export some deer to Israel and help you guys out. We have, we have plenty out here. Um, but my grandfather used to process uh, for all the deer hunters. They'd bring their deer over, and that's exactly what he did. They would, they would field dress the deer you know, and then bring him uh, to process the meat. But that's exactly what, what you mentioned. All the, the blood is drained. They, you know, even here, I don't think people think about it because unless you've seen a butcher and how they uh, butcher an animal and how they process the meat, most people pick it up from the store and don't realize that uh, the blood has been drained, you know, from the animals. That even here, we, that's how we do that, you know. And uh, even today, I think it's very interesting, so. Very good. And, uh, you know, so the whole thing of the blood, we, our, our first, it's very important to understand that's, that the blood is the life or the, in the soul of a person or, or, or even the animal. And uh, First John 1, 7 said, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And this is the jump that there need to be understood from just not eating the blood, the blood is, is holy or is the life, to the fact that Jesus' blood cleanses us from all sin. And this is really, uh, this jump is something that we're trying to understand here. 
So yeah, as you said, uh, all Jewish people in all uh, slaughterhouses, when you go, what's what is called a, a, a kosher meat. You know, you if I uh, go to buy, um, I want to make steak, okay, from from cow. Now, if I buy the meat from a butcher that is Jewish, I will probably pay a little more than if I buy it from a butcher that is not Jewish or it's, it's important meat. And the reason is that for every butcher that or everyone that's when they slaughter the cow there is it's not it's not a rabbi but there's one so, that somebody that need to make sure that they do it according to the law and when they kill the animal they must kill the animal with a knife on the throat otherwise you should not eat that meat because the blood did not the animal did not bleed now all this talking is very you know it's very bloody <laughs> everything that we say here but this is how it is this is how it is. And, um, and it's all come from that Leviticus, but even, as I said, from the time of Noah. Yeah, I, it's okay, too. People need to hear it because they don't, um, for the longest, until The Passion of Christ came out, the movie that Mel Gibson did, most of our movies that portrayed the sacrifice of Christ on the cross were very, um, they, they would have made, I mean, most, for all audiences, it was, probably generally approved, but that was one of the first movies that probably portrayed the gore and the blood of, of that. Um, but I was thinking about when you said that, I'll let you continue, the other verse that when you mentioned that, I was talking about Cain and Abel, and I wrote this down when you were talking, but <clears throat> like the power in the blood that even God understands, even back in the Old Testament, that in Genesis, when, uh, when Cain and Abel were in their little spit spat you know and, and Cain killed Abel and yeah. God approached him and said what have you done and he said you know I'm not my brother's keeper etc cetera, etc cetera. but then God said in Genesis 4 10 what have you done listen your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground right it, that's amazing to me how um, the blood speaks even though Abel was not Christ obviously but his blood spoke as well. And I think about, um, as you're talking, we need to talk more about the blood. There's nothing wrong with that. We need to understand it. We sing songs about this all the time, that yeah. there's power in the blood. The blood speaks a better word. The blood is a sure, I mean, we talk about it all the time, but we talk about it in songs and we talk about it in phrases. But when you get into the Bible, it is very, very much called a blood covenant for a reason. And um, I think it's appropriate. So you go ahead, keep talking about it, my friend. Yeah. Yeah, there's, I think there's a, a very famous gospel song. Uh, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. You know this one? Yes. Uh-huh. I do know that one. Yeah. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. So this, you know, when you hear this, oh, what, what is this? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard, right? It's hard. And you just sing it <laughs> like uh, it's, a, it's a nice song, but it's, it's not easy to, to hear this, right? Now I want to go to talk about something else regarding blood and again with Jesus. And that's a story that happened around Capernaum. And it's a story about a woman and that woman uh, had a blood issue for 12 years, uh, uh, hemorrhage. She, she was bleeding all the time. And it says uh, that she was, she, there was a, a lot of crowd around Christ and she came and she touched his cloak. She thought to herself, if I just touch his garment, I will get well. And immediately uh, the flow of the, her blood was dried up. That's a story. That's how the story starts. And this, okay, that's the miracle. And, and, and Jesus felt something and he asked, who, who, who touched me? Who touched my garment? And on the people, the disciples said, well, what do, you, what do you mean who touched you? Look how many people are there here. Everybody touched you, right? And then the woman, and that, that's the interesting part. The woman she was, it's, it's written, I'm reading now uh, from Mark 5. 
But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him all the whole truth. And the question, why was she fearing and trembling? I mean, people with leprosy, blind people, paralyzed people, all of those people touched him. Why was she so afraid? And uh, every Jewish person that, I don't know, I'll ask you this question. Every Jewish person know exactly the reason why she was afraid. But uh, people that are not Jewish may, may not understand this. And I want to read something now from Leviticus. Leviticus 15. And this explains exactly what was the, the thing with that woman. Not about the, the, the blood issue she had. Okay, people, women sometimes have blood issues, but why was she so afraid to touch him? And uh, Leviticus 15, starting from 20, 25 to 27, I'm reading. Now, this is part of the laws of purity and impurity. Uh, and it says, now, if a woman has a discharge of her blood many days, not at the period of her menstrual impurity, or if she has, or, or if she has discharge beyond that period, all the days of her impure discharge, she shall continue as though in her menstru menstrual impurity. She's unclean. Any bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge shall be to her like her bed at menstruation. And everything on which she sits shall be unclean. Like her uncleanness at that time. Likewise, whoever, now listen to this, whoever touches them, the, the clothes and, and her bed, Whoever touches them shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Now you understand what, that woman, what was the problem of that woman. That woman, if for 12 years she had a blood issue, she couldn't touch any man or any person, but any man. So I don't know if she was married before that, but for the last 12 years, no man touched her. She, everything she touched became unclean. Every person she touched needs to bathe himself and is unclean. And at work, now what is she doing? She's going and touching the garment. She didn't even touch his skin. She touched the garment of Jesus. So I don't know, you know, and, and as I said, all the Jewish people know this. Why? Because all the Orthodox Jews, all the women, all the Orthodox women, in all Jewish communities, when they have their period, after the period, after two weeks, they go to the mikveh, to a ritual bath, to clean themselves. And the time that they are, what's according to the law, unclean, those around two weeks that they're considered unclean, their husband cannot touch them. And nobody's allowed to touch them. Now, other women can, but not, not their husbands. So, you see that the blood that comes out from the body is unclean. And this is, uh, do, do you know, did you know that, uh, Jody, the, the thing about the woman? Uh, well, since you, you know, when we were there, uh, one of the things I was gonna say, yeah, since you explained it, it made a lot more sense in this verse of scripture um, one thing I would do is, why don't you explain, because uh, I got a feeling I'm going to get some questions about this. What is a mikvah? Just, just to be sure everyone understands that. Okay, so uh, it, it's not, well, you say that it says that uh, a person that touches needs to bathe, to go to, to wash himself, right? This, this is what I was just reading. Uh, bathe, bathe in water and be unclean. They need to bathe the clothes, they need to bathe themselves. So uh, this is part of the law. Now, the Jewish people or the Israelites from, and even in the time of Jesus, how do they follow this? They set a certain place that was called a ritual bath. In Hebrew, we call it a mikveh, which means 
means uh, a small reservoir of water, a mikve. And those places were only meant for cleansing, not for washing other things, it's only for cleansing. So people that had to cleanse themselves with water, like in the case of that woman, but also there are cases of men that need to clean, cleanse themselves. They had to go to those mikvehs and clean themselves. Now the way is that you go all the way to the water, immerse yourself completely, and then you go out clean. Uh, this is until today in every city in Israel and also in big cities in America where the big Orthodox communities you'll have mikvehs like this and all the women in the, in the years that they have period they go every month after the period they go to clean themselves men also go in certain cases this is something very common and uh, I want to tell you something about this uh, not many people understand this, but when John the Baptist called for people to, to immerse in water, actually for them, it was just immersing and cleansing themselves from their sins in the water, in a mikveh, in a ritual bath, just as they were doing always. Just that this time they added the repentance to this. So John called for repentance. But this was like going to the Jordan River. This was some kind of a mikveh, of a ritual bath. Yeah, that's good, man, because that helps explain uh, it, it so much more when people are hearing you talk about this. That'll help put it in perspective, especially what you're saying about John the Baptist. That's really neat. Really need to hear about that. Um, I think it's going to open up a lot of eyes right here when you're referring to this, that the blood that comes out is unclean and, and how important it is to understand that, that, you know, we need to be cleansed, if you will, that our blood is tainted and that's male and female. Obviously you're giving the example of a female, but like you said, um, our blood is, is impure. It, it's just in and of itself, no matter how, the thing that we always tell people that when talking to individuals about the need for Christ is why we get into the conversations about, well, you're a good person, not a good person, has nothing to do with it. When you're born into this world, your DNA, the blood cells, the molecules of your existence, which the life is in the blood, it, your blood is tainted even as an infant. You cannot fix that without Christ. So I, this explanation is, I think, wonderful, Ron. Thank you for that. Yeah, and uh, the blood is of every person and of er every animal is something that God gave to us. And, it's, and I, I read it already, and I want to emphasize this. In Leviticus 17, it says, for the, li for the life is in, of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. Mm. So God gave us the animal of the bloods as atonement. It's not that we give it to him. He gave it to us. He gave us the option, the ability to atone for our sins using the bloods, the blood of the animals. So instead of us, giving our blood, he gave us the blood of the animals because there's no atonement without blood because, and as, as he said, that the blood, the life is in the blood. So if you have, if you sinned and your whole, your, your, your life is in sin, you need some atonement and you need the blood. So instead of your own blood, be, instead of being killed for your sin, God gave you a way to atone for that with an animal. That's what's written in, in Leviticus, okay? So we, we're going now, we see that something very special about the blood. It had some kind of a dual quality, dual essence. On one hand, it's holy, it's, it's the life. On the other hand, it's impure when it comes out of the body, we should not touch it. So, in fact, I, I don't think that it's impure, but because it's holy, we're not allowed to touch it. We're not allowed 
to deal, to play with it, to do anything with it. So when someone bleeds and, and or a woman bleeds and, and someone touch it, it's holy. And therefore, when a person touch it, it's impure because he touched something holy, you know? So it's not that the blood itself is impure. It's that we're not allowed to touch it. Mm. Or we, we're not allowed to eat it. We're not allowed to touch when a person bleeds like a woman. And this makes us uh, unclean. Mm. And we need to, to clean ourselves. And, uh, and this is that, I think this brings some understanding of what is the, the, the blood in our life. What is blood? It's the life. It's something that God gave to us in animals so we can atone for our own sins. And later on, we'll see what happened when uh, God decides to make some change here and, and forgive all our sins with his own son's blood. That's, of course, what will happen later. But in, in the time of when the people, when the sons of Israel got the, the law, they just got the idea of animals to atone. That verse in Leviticus 10, I mean, Leviticus 17 and verse 10, when he said that, that, man, he basically, he gives, he gives you the animal. God gave us the animals in a sense in the Old Testament. He gave you that for the blood sacrifice so that your life would not have to be sacrificed. It's just a beautiful picture of God's grace to me. Yeah. That's amazing, bro. Like, you know what you should have done right there? <clears throat> so here, I don't know if you have this expression there, but over here, uh, they say, drop the mic. Do you have that expression in Israel? Yeah. Yeah. So you should have just took the pen and held it out in front and just said, like that, because that was so good. I mean, I'm just, I'm going to drop the mic for you, man. That was, that was so good, Ron. <laughs> 